It's book by book again. Here we are, and I don't know whether you're sharing in this in a, with a number of friends around the screen there, or whether you're just on your own, uh, or in a big, big seminar, or whether you're watching on TV, or whether you're maybe listening on radio, but here we are, we know where we are. We are at All Souls Church in Langham Place, London, England. I'm Richard Bewes, and um, I'm joined here by Paul Blackham, Dr. Paul Blackham, and we're also joined by our very honored guest, and that is Anne Graham Lotz from North Carolina in the USA. And it's a joy for us to be looking now in the fifth of our studies in the John's Gospel. We're coming to John chapter 8, right through to chapter 10, verse 21. That's where we are. And um, we're already, we've had the themes of Jesus revealing the Father, teaching others, working in this world, feeding, as we were thinking about the flesh and the and the blood and the, you know, and the, the feeding of the 5,000 and so on last time. Now we come on to the theme of shining, from feeding to shining. And I, I don't know where to start, except maybe, let's look at chapter 10, towards the end. And we'll start halfway through verse 10. Christ's words, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's Jesus speaking. And as we now look at this, these two chapters, two and a bit chapters. Let's see if we can't get some help from Anne to begin with. See, we begin chapter 8 with the incident further back of the, the Pharisees wanting to stone a lady who had been caught in adultery. How does Jesus deal with the crowd and with the woman, Anne? Well, it was so dramatic. It's I can't moving. imagine anything more awful than to have been caught in sin like that and then dragged before a self-righteous religious group all ready con to condemn you, thinking nothing of your feelings. Uh, and not that she was, um, I mean, she certainly was into something she shouldn't have been into, but, but the way they handled it was so um, oblivious and uncaring of who she was as a person. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what Jesus did. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion, I guess, as to what he did, but he knelt down and wrote something in the dirt, and I've nobody... heard your father, Dr. Billy Graham, yeah. says he thinks he was, she, that he was writing the Ten Commandments. Well, down. I think that's a very good guess mm. because if that's what he was doing, he was holding up the standard of the law mm. that no one could meet. So mm. not just the woman who was caught in adultery, but all of those self-righteous mm. Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders would have been convicted of their sin. And then Jesus said, you know, for the person who was without sin to cast the first stone, and nobody could claim to be without sin. And so as the crowd melted away, it was just the woman who was left, and, uh, and Jesus asked her where her accusers were, and she said, you know, they've all left, and he said, well, I'm not condemning you either. Go and sin no more. And I think that's an important point to bring out, perhaps. We think he let her off pretty easy, but actually he, he's not there to punish us. He doesn't want to get back at us. He, he just wants us to repent of our sin mm -hmm. and to turn away from our sin. And he brought this woman to a point that she acknowledged her sin and she was willing to turn away from it and he forgave her. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful, tender way that he dealt with her and also a very um, a convicting way that he dealt with her accusers. So, I, you know, I'd be interested one day to know what he wrote in the, the ground, but I think uh, that's a very good guess. Mm, we see Jesus there and then shining yeah. in his tenderness and in his attitude towards women where he's led the world, really, in that whole field, which is so important. Mm -hmm. We see him shining in many places. Look, here's the darkness and light theme, Paul, in, uh, in the whole of John. I mean, this theme occurs often. Verse 12, I am the light of the world. Why does John weave this into the whole chapter? I mean, why does he organise his material so much around light and darkness, Paul? It's another one of John's really favourite things, and so often he tells us whether a person's meeting Jesus at night or during the day, or whether something happens early morning or dusk. Or It's important to him because the whole... He, right at the beginning, he's told us that he is God the Word. Jesus is God the Word. 
the, the light that lights everybody who comes into the world on a cosmic scale. And here's the light shining very brightly here. And you would think, well, if a light's shining very brightly right in front of you, you can't miss it. You can't miss it. You're bathed in light. And yet, this is the amazing thing. People can be right in front of the brightest, most incredible light of all and be in total darkness. And that's the incredible sort of enigma of what we're reading here. Total darkness alongside brilliant light. And all the way through, these stories now are going to be guiding us to understand how that can be, how light can shine, and yet there be darkness right in front of the light. And it's always asking us to understand that, that um, as the diagnosis back in John chapter 3, men love darkness. So even when the light shines right in front, it says, no, we want the darkness, we want the darkness, we want the darkness. We don't want him, we don't want the light. And that's sort of helping us to understand what is fundamentally at stake. Jesus is there, the light, he's beckoning people, come into the light that you can, you can see clearly, understand yourselves. I, w- I welcome you into the light and people recoiling from the light. John loves always helping us to understand and think more deeply in that way. My parents, you know, said when they were on the mission field in Africa, uh, that uh, right opposite the mission station would be the, the most godless homes that would never come near the place, but other places outside would come near. It maybe seems to be symptomatic, really. Of, do, you think, do you agree with that, Anne? Yeah, and I was just thinking back to the story of the woman caught in adultery. Mm. When he wrote that on the ground, he was really bringing light into the mm. situation, wasn't he? Yeah. And, and revealing through the light of God's Word and the light of that law and the truth, the sin in their own lives. And so to finish out that statement in John chapter 3, men would rather be in darkness because their deeds are evil. Because the light not only reveals who Jesus is and, and who the truth is, but it reveals their own sin. And we don't want to acknowledge and confess our sin. We don't want to see ourselves that way because of the pride. And I think these religious leaders were extremely proud of them, mm. themselves, their religion, their positions, and they didn't want to see that they mm. were sinners and in essence, in nature, no different from this woman who was caught in adultery. Mm. And, and so I think Jesus is going ahead and making a point that the light is the light of truth and love and who he is, but they don't want him. And so it's yeah. a choice almost, isn't it, to yeah. remain in darkness, yeah. that as we reject the light, we will be in the darkness. We're seeing in these chapters Jesus in his shining majesty. And one of the great messages that seems to come through really from all of these chapters is you can't have God if you won't have Jesus. Um, now, would you think that's true of, of John 8 uh, here? In I think that sort of sums it up in a way. Yeah. And, you know, it goes back to this theme that we were discussing in chapter 5. But in chapter 8, verse 18, he says, I'm the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the one who sent me, the Father. And they asked, where is your Father? And they said, you don't know me or my Father. If you knew me, you would know the Father also. And Jesus is clearly declaring that he and his Father are one. In other words, he and God are one. If you've seen him, you've seen God. If, you've, if you see God, you've seen Jesus. They're, they are one and the same. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so if you, if you say you believe in God, but that somehow believing in Jesus is an optional extra, or I think you were calling it an optional luxury, yeah. <laughs> that you can pick and choose if you want to believe in Jesus, but yes, we all believe in God. He's saying you can't do that. That if you say you believe in God, then yes, you will believe in Jesus because Jesus is God and he's the revelation of God to man. Mm-hmm. To say that you won't believe in Jesus, then whatever God you're worshiping is not the one true living God of the universe. Yeah. Uh, it's an incredibly strong statement. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Do you so, like, it's, it's I like it because sometimes people will say to me, oh, I believe in God, or I ask them, do you believe in God? And they'll, yes, I believe in God. So which I always say, oh, so when did you become a Christian? When did you love and trust Jesus? And they're like, I don't love and trust Jesus. Well, then you don't believe in the real and living God. Whatever you believe in is a phantom, an idol, a false God. That's an incredible truth. Yeah. And I think in this day of, uh, you know, so many different religions, so many different systems. ways of, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that Jesus is the one true living God in the flesh. And Paul, when we're at the, towards the end of John 8, here's Jesus in confrontation with some of his critics. And, uh, you know, th- there's the thought about, um, he's only 50, not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? They ask. Would you just like to, Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, Jesus would have had to be 2,000 years of age to have met Abraham. What is this issue all about? Well, 
we've seen that you can't know God without knowing Jesus. And of course, that isn't like a, a new arrangement that suddenly God says, well, everyone's been able to know me directly up till now, but I'm afraid from now on, it's going to be more complicated and we're going to have this Jesus guy in between. Because that'd be ridiculous. It'd mean things were worse now than before. It isn't that way. And he's really, the challenge throughout the chapter has been, they're saying, we're just like Abraham. And he says, no, no, no. Abraham did not treat me the way you treat me. And this has been building up, and they're sort of beginning to dawn. How can, it, he can't know Abraham. But what's he talking about? Abraham, Abraham treated him differently. And it really comes to it, where they're saying, you haven't met Abraham. You're not even 50, you'd have to be thousands of years old. And he says, oh, I've met Abraham, don't you worry. In, In fact, verse 56 is so important, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of yeah. seeing my day. He saw it. He saw day. it. So Abraham looked forward to something, yeah. it happened, and he was thrilled by it. So Abraham looked forward to meeting me. You're not interested in me. Oh, I do. you're not 50. And then he says, oh, yeah, no, don't worry, I met Abraham. And I met Moses too, because then he says... <laughs> um, before Abraham was born, I am. And that is the name. Not just, I mean, because they really react strongly to this when he says that that is who he is. Because in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses meets the angel of the Lord at the burning bush, and Moses says, well, who are you? And the, and the angel of the Lord there says, oh, my name is I am. So Jesus doesn't back down at all when they doubt. He says, oh, yeah, Abraham, sure, and Moses, they both treated me properly. And if you really want to learn from them, you need to treat me like they did. It's really, it's, it's, I think it's one of the most shocking things in the whole of John, really. It's shocking, <laughs> and it's also thrilling for yeah, the reader of John's Gospel, isn't it? Um, so, Anne, when we come into the next chapter, chapter 9, it seems to be concerned quite a lot with sight. Um, what's the lesson of the... There's a lesson coming out of this healing of the blind man that we read about here. I, I think it's just what Paul was talking about, because they could not see yeah. who Jesus is, and that he knew Abraham, he knew Moses, he is the I am that I am, the eternal God in the flesh. They could not see it. So in chapter 9, we have this physical illustration of him yeah. creating sight in this man who was born blind, so that a man who was born blind could see. And so he, he gave the man his sight. And at the end of this chapter, I mean, they, they take this poor blind man. The, the scene in the temple is almost ridiculous where they put him on trial because he dared to have someone give him sight <laughs> on the Sabbath. Yeah. There again, Jesus in your face yeah, on the Sabbath, on you know. Sabbath. But, but he gave him sight. And so they put him through a trial and they interrogate him. They drag his parents in. Mm -hmm. How dare you have a son who had received sight on the Sabbath? <laughs> and in the end, the, the man says, you know, I don't know who gave me sight because I was blind. But he said, all I know is he rubbed something on my eyes, told me to go wash. When I washed, then I could see. Once I was blind, now I see. And he said, I believe this man who did this must be from God. And the leaders were so outraged, they threw him out of the temple. And I think that means not just bodily, but mm -hmm. basically excommunicated mm -hmm. him so he could no longer participate in the ceremonies and the rituals that would give him a right relationship with God. So he's out. He's totally separated from God. And so he's out wandering in the periphery of the temple when this man comes up to him and says, uh, you know, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he didn't, he had never seen the man before, but he recognized his voice and it was the same one who told him to go wash. And so, G and of course it was Jesus and the man worshiped Jesus as the Son of God. And then Jesus turned to the religious leaders gathered around and said, this man was blind, now he can see. You who say you can see, and now he's talking about spiritual. You know, you say you see, and yes, you know the truth, but you remain blind. And they just get outraged. And that leads to chapter 10 when he talks about the false shepherds because those religious leaders were false shepherds trying to rob this poor blind man of his right relationship with God, the joy he had in his healing. So, it, it, you know, these chapters, it's neat to see the way they just lead right into each other. It's lovely to hear you speak like this. I mean, let's quickly, in the last few seconds, really, Paul, move from seeing the truth to hearing the truth in John 10. You know, my sheep know my voice. Is Jesus the good shepherd or is he the gate into the sheepfold? Yeah. Well, he gives two little parables. In the first one, the, the emphasis is on the what's, the what's the correct way in, and it's about the gate. Uh, and he's like, so who, the correct, there's only one way in to the true sheepfold of God, and he's it. 
And then he has a, another little parable, and this time it's all the same thing about sheep and shepherds and things. But in this one he says, now I'm the true shepherd, mm -hmm. as opposed to these Pharisees who... Mm -hmm. uh, and what's good is, the real sheep recognise Jesus, because mm -hmm. he's the true shepherd. But these Pharisees, like the man, the woman taking adultery, the parents of the man, they didn't rate the Pharisees because their voice was not the voice of God. But they did respond to Jesus because his was the voice of God. That's right. Isn't that wonderful? We cover this at lightning speed. But here and there, well, all of us know people who have said questions like, asked questions like this, is Jesus it, really it? Or is he something part of another, another bigger system than that? And as we come to John's Gospel, we come inescapably to this understanding of the wonderful truth that is enshrined here. Oh yes, Jesus is the very person we've been looking for all our lives. He created us. He's won us, he loves us, he died for us, and we can be part of his flock forever, wherever we live, anywhere around the world. Again, the word, whosoever. It's wonderful to share with you, and just thank you very much.